Okay, so today what we do is we'll start on one of the last few topics that we have. What I'm going to do this week is just a couple, uh, couple of other topics that are important from the point of view of circuit design but are more or less standalone topics on their own. Okay, just separate things that can be covered. So one of them is the subject of interconnect. And what we mean by interconnect is the wiring that is used in order to connect all the different gates together in a IP. Okay. So, so far we have been looking only at the gates themselves and not really at how they are connected together. We just assume that there are wires that can connect all the gates together in any way that we like. Okay. And as far as the gates themselves are concerned, we know that they have a certain input capacitance, they have output parasitic capacitances they also have a driving capability, right? The amount of current that they can deliver in order to drive the capacitance that they are connected to. In addition to all of this, the wiring that is used in order to connect these gates together itself can start to play an important part in the overall delay and the resistance and capacitance that are actually encountered by any gate that is trying to drive a part of a circuit. Okay. So, Nowadays, in the so-called deep submicron technology, this contribution from the interconnect is no longer negligible. We cannot just assume that they are ideal wires. So, we need to spend a little time understanding what exactly is involved in the sort of construction of these wires. Okay. So, the first thing of course is what is used in order to connect all these different gates together? It is metal. Right? Some kind of metal deposit on the IC which is used in order to connect the different parts of the circuit together. Okay? And typically just like the other parts of the circuit, so for example you have the diffusion corresponding to the source and drain, you have an oxide corresponding to the gate, you have some other polysilicon on top of the oxide in order to act as the gate terminal and so on, right? Similarly you also have various steam of steps and the deposit uh, dep deposition which is used in order to create the wire. Okay. So, before we get into the discussion of what the wires are like and so on, there are a few pieces of terminology that we want to keep in mind while discussing these wires, right? First of all, where do the wires get constructed? Supposing this is the substrate, right? The wires will typically not be directly on top of the substrate. What you have on the substrate is the N plus P plus diffusion, directly above that is the gate oxide layers and so on. After there is typically an insulating oxide layer, right, above that. And only then come the wires. So the wires typically will be on a significantly higher level than the rest of the material of the gate, of the transistor, right. So this is an example of what a wire looks like. I will just draw another wire next to it. So now what we have over here is, there are some parts that we need to keep in mind over here. What are the different things which govern the behavior of this? So this underneath is the substrate, right? There is typically some height above the substrate where the wires are, right? This height, we will call it H, the height of the metal wire above the substrate, okay? Next comes the thickness of the wire, T, okay? Then comes the length of the wire L and the width of the wire W. Okay? So there are four parameters over here, H, 
T, L, and W. Right? Height above the substrate, thickness of the wire, length of the wire, and width of the wire. Right? These are the four main parameters that you are interested in as far as understanding what the different aspects of a wire are concerned. Right? Where, what is the kind of resistance that it has, the capacitance that it, that it has and so on. Okay? Now, as far as these wires are concerned, there are a few important things to keep in mind. One of them is typically what you would like to do would be to have something like probably a thin sheet of metal, right, carrying current, okay. The wider that this or rather the thicker that this metal is made, what will happen to the resistance? What will happen to the resistance in the second case? Huh? It should decrease, right? It will be less than in the previous case. The other possibility that it can use is also to do this. This will also have a lower resistance, right? Which of these two would you prefer for wiring? Supposing I wanted to reduce the resistance, which of these two would you prefer to use? Huh? The upper one, why? You can cram more wires into the same space, right? The area as seen from above is lower for the upper wire, right? So because of that, typically what happens is, nowadays at least, this kind of a wire, right? So what you have over here is, this is T, the thickness, and this is W, right? This quantity T by W is called the aspect ratio, right? We came across a similar term in the context of SRAM also. There also we have something called the aspect ratio, which is basically the width by height of the SRAM, right? And there again what we wanted was, we did not want an aspect ratio which was very skewed. We wanted it to be as close to 1 as possible, so that the shape of the SRAM block is symmetric, right? Over here it's not that you care for it being close to 1, but you do care about what the aspect ratio is, right? Now typically this one has an aspect ratio which is much less than 1, right? Whereas this has the aspect ratio may be greater than 1. Not much greater than 1, but definitely greater than 1. Right? So, typically what we would, what happens in modern technologies, in the wiring that is used nowadays, is to go for an aspect ratio, a typical value is close to 2. Right? So that your wires typically look something like this. This thickness is twice as much as the width. Okay? Now that's not necessarily and that's not absolutely necessary that you keep that exact T by W equal to 2. You can make the W a bit greater as well. T is something you cannot change. The process technology determines how much is the value of T, right? Because it essentially determines how thick is that deposition of metal. Okay? That is not something that you can control because on top of that comes another layer of insulating oxide followed by other metal layers, so you cannot change T. W can be changed by the design, okay? But for the most part, you try and keep it to a constant value so that you get the best possible density of wires at any level that you have, okay? Now, modern technology, the technology that I am talking about here is 180 nanometers. That's about 10 years old. So it's not really a modern technology in the sense that it's the latest cutting edge. But the same principles more or less have continued to hold in even the 
more recent technology. So I am going to stick with numbers for 180 nanometers for the test. Okay, to sort of illustrate what the numbers are. Typically what we have is something like many different layers of metal wires which can be used one on top of the other. Okay, and what happens in that case is usually we have the substrate On top of that, we have one layer of metal wires which are running like this. The next layer of metal wires will usually be crosswise. Okay, and then you have another layer on top of that which will again be in the other direction. The horizontal vertical keeps alternating. alternating horizontal and vertical layer, right? What is the reason for that? It's because ultimately you want to be able to reach from anywhere on the chip to anywhere else. But to, supposing you have some kind of a complex design where you took a wire like this, right? It essentially means that any further wires that are trying to cut across on the same layer, right? This will not be allowed, this will not be allowed. So you cannot have wires crossing each other on the same layer because they are at exactly the same height above the substrate. Okay. So if I want to have something which is able to connect from one corner of the circuit to another, then I need to have horizontal wires as well as vertical wires. The typical approach that is used is to say that, let's say you have horizontal wires on layer 1, then on layer 2 you will have vertical wires, on layer 3 you will have horizontal, layer 4 you will have vertical and so on. Okay. Now, that's not absolutely necessary, you can of course have some small changes in the wire. So, you can have a wire which is mostly horizontal, goes vertical for a short distance and then once again goes horizontal, right? But the majority of the routing will be either purely horizontal or purely vertical. That's so that you can increase the number of wires that are present over there in each place. Okay? So now, with that in mind, typical technology, the 180 nanometer technology that I am going to just give you a little bit more detail about has six layers of metal. Okay? Nowadays, 10 layers or more are common. Right? 10 layers are quite common in most of the technologies. You might have even more than that. Okay? It is sort of similar for those of you who have done a circuit board design, printed circuit board. Printed circuit board has similar kinds of concentration. There also you have to route wires between the various components which are on the board. Okay. And what you need to do is you need to make sure that the number of wires can be maximized. So you try and keep it so that horizontal wires and vertical wires go on to alternate layers. Similarly, you will usually keep one layer specifically for VVD, one layer for ground. Right? And the clock signals that are going around between the different parts of the circuit also have to be routed very carefully. Okay. So all of those considerations, whatever you would do in a circuit board design, also apply to a large extent for IC design. Okay. So now, just to get into a little bit more detail on what a 180 nanometer technology would look like, typically what you would have is something like this. From substrate, eight hundred nanometers until the first metal layer starts. Okay, so effectively the thickness of that first insulating oxide is around eight hundred nanometers. Okay. Keep in mind this has nothing, in, or rather 800 nanometers is not a multiple of 180 nanometers. So the fact that you have 180 nanometer technology is sort of indicated. Lot of the numbers that you will see over here will not be multiples of 180. Right? So that's another thing to keep in mind. The scalable CMOS, the idea that we had earlier, right, that we will just use one lambda parameter and then have all, everything, all transistors, high yields and everything else in, as multiples of that lambda is not strictly true in more recent technology. We don't bother to keep all wires and everything exactly multiples of that lambda. Okay? 
to the extent possible you do, but that's about it. You don't really bother about it beyond that. You have computer-aided tools that can allow you to do all the analysis to make sure that the rest of the constraints are automatically satisfied. Okay? So in this case, what are the types of constraints that we have? Let's say we have two metal layers and two wires at metal 1. Right? What are the parameters that we are interested in? One is the thickness, the width, and one more parameter here which is S. Right? The minimum distance between wires. Okay? So in this case what happens is the thickness of the wire typically for metal 1 usually called the M1 layer is about 400 nanometers. Okay? So that is T in this case. Right? W is 250 nanometers, right? It's not 180 nanometers, it's not 360 nanometers, in other words, it's not 2 lambda or 4 lambda, it's somewhere in between, okay? But this is just a constraint which is put over there from the point of view of the manufacturing process. 250 nanometers is a comfortable thickness that you can get to, which will allow you to actually lay out wires of that size without having too much variation in that width of thickness, okay? And the distance between wires, that is S, is also 250 nanometers. Okay? So what is the aspect ratio for layer 1? How do you calculate that? What is the aspect ratio? Huh? How do you calculate it? Somebody please speak a bit loudly, it's very depressing to know, just be the only person speaking to One point is, how do you get that? T by W. Okay, so T by W is what you want over here. Sorry, one mistake I made was, this is not 400, this is 480. So T by W is a bit more than that, it's around 1.9 also. Okay, still less than 2 but close to 2. Okay, alright. So similarly, the rest of it, I am just going to put down the numbers over here. You don't have to learn these numbers by heart. I am putting them down over here so that they are more indicated, right? You have the numbers over there which sort of tell you what different layers look like. So the second layer is typically 700 nanometers above the first layer. The thickness T of that is 700 nanometers. The W is 320, S is also 320, okay? So what does this mean? Metal 2 in that case, what would you expect the resistance of metal 2 to be compared to metal 1? Less, right? Because it has a bigger area of cross-section. T is higher and W is also higher, okay? So the area of cross-section of metal 2 is higher than that of metal 1, which means that the resistivity per unit length right, should be lower, resistance per unit length would be lower than that for the metal 1, okay. Similarly, we go up the scratch, we leave another 700, get to metal 3, where also we have 700 nanometers, so metal 2 and metal 3 are essentially identical, right. Then comes another gap of 700 followed by metal 4 which is more than 1 micron in thickness. Okay? And has 540 as the W and S value. Okay? Then you have metal 5 and metal 6. I am just putting down the numbers quickly over here. The gap between metal 4 to metal 5 is nearly 1 micron, is 1 micron, followed by a thickness of 
1.6 micron. Another 1 micron on top of that, followed by about 1.7 micron, 1,720 nanometers. Okay? You don't have to learn these numbers by heart, but look at what's happening. You have gone from a thickness of about 480 nanometers at the lowest level to about four times that, nearly four times of that. Okay, three and a half times of that, 1700 nanometers at metal six. Okay? The gap between layers has gone from around 700 nanometers between metal one and metal two to about one micron between metal five and metal six. Okay? The aspect ratio pretty much remains more or less the same, very close to two. By the time you reach the upper layers, it is two exactly. Okay? And the spacing between wires also increases proportionately. So if the wire is thicker, the spacing between two consecutive wires is also made correspondingly thicker. Okay? So, this essentially tells us what we have over here, right? We have different layers which are sort of growing in height as well as thickness as we go further up the stack. Okay? The most common thing that is done is this is usually the wiring for the actual in internal cell internal wire. Right? Whatever wiring you need inside the cells or possibly some little bit of wiring between cells. Right? Metal 2 to metal 4 are used for most of the intermediate distance routing. The majority of the routing happens over here. Right? What do you mean by routing? Just the connections between the different cells. Okay? What do you think metal 5 and metal 6 would be used for? What are the... What is the main property of metal 5 and metal 6? Huh? In terms of resistance, what will it do? Very less, right? So the resistance of metal five and metal six will be the least. So what wire, what kind of connection would you use that for? Huh? VVD ground and the clock. Okay. So those are the three things that are typically routed on these layers. Okay. Why? Simply because the resistance is so low. The capacitance is a different story. We'll look at that a little bit later. But even the capacitance is not so bad because even the spacing between the wires and so on is correspondingly being increased. So it may not be as bad as, you know, just because you have a larger metal plate doesn't necessarily mean that you have a larger capacitance. Okay. But we have to understand exactly what the capacitance looks like in, in a bit more detail. The most important thing is the resistance comes down. So VDD and ground, which are going to carry the natural amount of current, are typically routed on those layers, right? And metal 2, 3, 4 are used for routing between cells. Metal 1 is also possibly used for routing between cells, but primarily for the cell internal routing itself, it is kept for that. Okay? It has the smallest area of cross-section and hence the highest resistivity per unit length, resistance per unit length. Okay? On the other hand, it has the highest density of wires. Whereas metal 5 and metal 6, the number of such wires that you can go is much lower than what you could do at the lower level. Okay? Now, how do you go between layers? What is it that allows you to connect between different layers in a wire? Okay? So there is this the idea of a wire is the same as what is used in PCB. You have one wire over here. You have another wire at a different level. I'm going to draw it the same direction, doesn't really matter. Okay. And you will have some kind of a connection between the two. That actually allows current to flow between the two. Okay. So you can have wires in principle from any layer to any other layer. 
But as far as possible, you would try and keep them so that the wires go from one layer to the next, to the next immediate layer. Okay? You don't try and have wires which directly lead from metal 1 to metal 3 or metal 5, for example. It's possible in principle, but it's better if you can sort of jump from one layer to the next. Okay? Even as far as the manufacturing process is concerned, these are done layer by layer. So, typically wires are constructed such that they go from one layer to the next and then you sort of further can build up on that in order to go to higher layer. Okay? So, the idea of a wire is exactly the same as what is used in PCB. Again, what happens is there is a hole through the insulating layer and something has to be put over there which allows conduction to happen through that. Which allows the two layers to be connected together electrically. Okay? And as long as you have that, there is the ability to connect between layers and you can sort of switch the routing also which means that you can without too much difficulty go between different layers for routing. Okay? But the wires will not have the same kind of resistance properties as metal. They will also be made of metal but on the other hand they have some other thing which has to be done in order to sort of go through the insulating layer. Right? So there is going to be some kind of a junction between the metal and something else that you have over there. Typically, having a large number of wires is undesirable. Okay? Nothing wrong with it, but it definitely breaks your wiring and sort of in increases the resistance and the impedance that the wiring is going to present. Okay? Now, for understanding these wires, one of the things that is usually done is, for any wire, any metal wire, the resistance is given by resistivity multiplied by the length divided by the area of cross section which in this case is T into W. Right? Now, for any given metal layer, which of these is constant? Rho is a constant of course, that is the property of the metal itself. T is a constant for that metal layer. Right? L and W are under the designer's control. So, what we do is, we take this as rho by t into L by w and call that quantity rho by t as r square. Okay. okay. This r square is essentially something called the heat resistance. Right. It is sort of called the resistance per unit square. It is a dimensionless unit. Right? So, what that means is, supposing I have a wire of this sort, right? its resistance will be given by R is equal to R square into L by W. Okay? Now, L L and W are both design parameters which are just drawn on the silicon, right? You actually, actually can just look at the layout and directly from that measure the values of L and W, okay? Now, what happens if I had another wire which was twice as long and twice as wide? Effectively what we are saying over here is this has 2L, this is 2W, okay. The number of squares that we have over here is exactly the same, right. So the resistance of this second wire will also be exactly the same as that of the first wire, right. It was easy enough to calculate that. I mean, you could have just calculated the L, the W and get R, right? So, why bother with this resistance per square business? It's because when you are looking at the layout, just counting the number of squares that you have is an easier thing to do when you are looking at the layout, right? Rather than actually, it's exactly the same thing, it's just a more convenient way of doing it, okay? So, essentially what we are saying is, from a designer's point of view, W and L are both under your control. If you want to increase the, or rather decrease the resistance, 
you could increase the value of w that's the only thing that you can do otherwise you are constrained by your length you are resistant to the proportional to your length okay the thickness is not something under your control unless you choose to go to a higher layer of net okay now what kind of metal is you right the typical bulk resistivity of different metals in units of micro ohm centimeter okay right? because resistivity into l by tw is the resistance so in units of micro ohm centimeter the different metals have properties roughly roughly like this silver has around 1.6 micro ohm centimeter it's the best known conducting metal copper is around 1.7 gold is about 2.2 aluminum is about 2.8 okay this is bulk resistivity at the kind of dimensions that we are looking at for ic layer routing okay this used to be the most common right but now this is currently the most common form of interconnect used in deep sub micron technology okay copper interconnect for a long time that it was considered almost impossible to actually make interconnect with copper but then there were some major processing steps that were that needed to be solved and once they were done it was possible to actually make copper interconnect now for more than 10 years now copper has been the predominant form of interconnect used in it the other sir silver and gold and so on are pretty much just too expensive for the kind of scale that we have over here right? now what's the approximate resistance that we are talking about the r r square value the heat resistance right metal one has around 0.08 ohm per square okay from that you can take a calculate what metal to it because it's the same material just a different value of the minimum thickness and this right so this converts to be about 0.05 and by the time you get to metal thick it is around 0.02 okay by contrast supposing you have polysilicon right and do this has a heat resistance in the region of 50 to 400 okay doped polysilicon is around 3 to 10 so order of magnitude better than and do but still order of magnitude worse than or two order of magnitude worse than metal Okay, which makes it clear that you can use the polysilicon for wiring only for relatively short length. Within a gate, if I just wanted to sort of connect up the two terminals together, I have polysilicon already being used for the gate terminal. I just want to sort of extend that wire and use it for connecting across two transistors. That is fine. But for anything else which is longer than that, you are much better going to a metal layer and connect. okay now apart from all of this the other reason why it sort of becomes tricky to use metal is there is also the question of contact right the ohmic contact that you want to create right contact resistance itself can be fairly large this can be in the region of 2 to 20 ohm okay which is why when you actually look at layout what you will find is that if you look at a picture of what an ic layout looks like for the uh, for the layout that you have done in magic so far what you would have seen is you, you typically take the entire area where the metal overlaps with the 
this is in our, the area that you want to make contact. You take these two regions and you just put a complete extra cross it for a contact. Right? What happens in practice is that many small contacts are formed. Okay? Now this is for two reasons. One is the individual contact resistance can be fairly large. What do I mean by individual contact resistance? From the process, the metal makes contact with a certain area of silicon. Right? What is the contact resistance at that point? Okay. Now rather than trying to make one area which is large, it is preferable to sort of make lots of many small contacts for two reasons. One is the overall area then becomes large and effectively all of these parallel contacts means that there is a smaller contact resistance. The second is, in due to the manufacturing itself, there is a possibility that one or more of the contacts may fail. There may be a fault in it. But if you create something like 8 or 12 contacts over there, the chances of all of them failing due to process variation is very small. Okay? So at most you might end up with a slightly higher impedance for the contact, but you will still end up with a functioning contact. Okay? So this is typically how it's done. You have many small contact points. which are used in order to actually create a metal to silicon contact. Okay. Now, the next thing that we need to be concerned about is, so far we have been talking only about the resistance, but these wires also have capacitance. Right? Now, typically what's the kind of capacitance that we are talking about over here? Let's consider one particular wire. Right? It will have wires above it, in the layer above, but which are typically going to be running in the opposite direction. So if this is horizontal, the other one is going to be vertical. Layer below also same story. Right? But what it can have is adjacent wires on the same layer, which are also running in the same direction. Okay? So it has capacitance to all of these. There is C top, C bottom, and C adjacent. Right? That is to say, the capacitance to the adjacent wire, which is on the same layer. Okay? Over here, we have S1. and we have S2, the height between the metal layers. We have the thickness of this layer itself, T, and we have the S, which is the minimum spacing between wires on the same layer. Right? All of these parameters are what are going to determine what the value of the capacitance is going to be. Okay? Now, capacitance itself is given by epsilon A by T, where epsilon is some K times epsilon naught, right? K or epsilon R, whatever it is, the relative epsilon, right? So, the K term is commonly used over here. What happens is what we are looking for is to have low K low values of K so that the capacitance between wires is reduced as much as possible. Okay? So from the point of view of the inter-wire capacitance, we would like to have as low a K as possible. Okay? So various techniques are used for that including in some cases introduction of small air pockets because the effectively that becomes instead of an insulating material that becomes air which has a lower permittivity than pretty much any other material that you have over there. Okay? So those are different techniques that are sometimes used at the 
lay out, not lay out, but the process level in order to reduce the capacity. Okay. Now, in terms of the capacitance itself, we also need to think in terms of what kind of capacitance model, physical model, can be used for. Okay. This is typically what a metal looks like, right? It has T which is approximately twice of W. I have exaggerated a bit over here, but T is about twice of W. Right? And you have the substrate below that. So there is this height. Okay? The problem with this kind of structure is it doesn't really look like the so called parallel plate capacitor. Right, where the field essentially just goes like this. Right. What we have instead is the electric field, rather than just looking at a parallel plate capacitance, it looks like something which is a fairly narrow set of plates that are separated by a relatively large gap. Okay? Such a model is called a fringing model. Right? These are called fringing fields. Okay? Now the major difference is in this case for parallel plates capacitance is proportional to W. Right? The width of the plate. Whereas over here, it is proportional to log of W. Okay? So you have a slightly different model which applies. You can't just directly put log of W in place of epsilon eta D. That's not how it works. But the point is that it does not really grow directly with W itself. It's and it does increase when W increases. But for small enough values of W, which is going to be proportional to log of W. Okay. So this can make a difference to how the capacitance gets modeled and how you estimate the value of the capacitance for actual cases. Right? Now, what this means is interlayer this is what it looks like. We have a printing model. Because we have two metals which are sort of narrow and tall and separated by a gap. But interlayer, it is a parallel plate model. Right? This is an approximation. In both cases, of course, there will be some amount of printing that happens in any case. The point is, in the case of interlayer, the effect is more pronounced than in the case of the intralayer. Right? So you need to use the printing model more for the interlayer capacitance than for the intralayer between two wires of the same layer. Okay? Alright. What is the approximate value of this capacitance? It turns out that an approximate number that you can work with is around 0.2 femtofarad per micron of wire length. Okay? Compare this. What is the other capacitance per unit length that we have worked with before? The gate capacitance. That was approximately around 2 femtofarads per micron, right? Turns out that both the gate capacitance and the diffusion parasitic capacitance were approximately 2 femtofarads per micron. Okay? So one thing is clear, the 
capacity per unit length of the wires is much lower than is an order of magnitude lower than that for the gate but on the other hand nowadays it's quite common to have wires which are 10 times longer than the gate length gate width okay so it's quite possible to have a fairly large capacitance because of the fact that you have long wires not because the capacitance the inner capacitance itself is large but because you have long wires the capacitance can get quite large okay all right we will stop here for now the next thing that we need to do is consider how do we model these in terms of distributed versus lumped models and do some estimates of what is actual capacitance that we get in a relatively complex setup with long wires okay